gonna, um, we're gonna make up the time somehow, we'll see. But um, uh, we're gonna switch to English now, in case, <laughs> in case that wasn't obvious already, because our next speaker is going to give our first talk in English on the stage. Um, I'm really happy to welcome Gillian York back to the Nets Fully Tea Conference. She's given fabulous talks in the last couple of years, so we're very happy that she joined us here today as well. Um, for those of you who have not had the pleasure of hearing her speak or know her well yet, Gillian is a writer and an activist whose work examines state and corporate censorship. She's based here in Berlin, and um, she's working from Berlin, but is also the Director for International Freedom of Expression at the, at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And she's also a fellow at the Center for Internet and Human Rights at the European Coordina University. Um, she's gonna focus on one of the core topics of her work today, which is online censorship. And she's going to examine all the measures that governments go to, not only online, but especially also offline, to silence critical voices around the world. Please give a warm welcome to Gillian York. Thank you. And to whoever it is that I, that I saw with the new EFF t-shirt, you got yours before me, so I'm, I'm very impressed. Okay. So, today's talk is about how offline repression is replicated online, and sometimes vice versa, in the opposite direction as well. As Geraldine said in the introduction, governments often find ways to go after targets through various means, censorship, surveillance, and nowhere in my estimation has this been more apparent than in Egypt. Now this talk is not about Egypt, it's about a lot of places, um, but I am going to focus on cases from Egypt today, and you'll see why as the talk goes along. So just to give you a quick summary of what's gone on there in the past decade, in case you were not watching the news, um, about 10 years ago, which is when I first made a lot of the connections with people that I'm gonna be speaking about, there was minimal online censorship in the country. There were not many websites that were blocked, despite the fact that the printed press was heavily censored and often manipulated. Um, I don't have the slide for this, unfortunately, but one of my favorite stories is from around 2008, 2009, when President Barack Obama from the US went to Egypt and was photographed um, with uh, Mubarak and a couple of other leaders from around the world. Now, in the original photo, Obama was standing at the front of the four leaders, but one of the major Egyptian newspapers actually like photoshopped it to put Mubarak at the front. So that was the kind of censorship, like Soviet level censorship that we were looking at. Um, censorship or manipulation, let's say. And so despite the fact that, or what, maybe because of the fact that minimal, uh, there was minimal online censorship, bloggers would kind of come about at the same time as they did everywhere else, spoke somewhat freely. They were critical of the government, they pointed out some of the things that were going on, and while it wasn't completely open, there were a lot of channels for people to debate and talk about politics. And it was that network building that, in part, I'm not gonna credit the internet for the 2011 uprising like so many people have, but it was those networks that were built through the internet and sometimes across borders that helped people to, you know, to get to know each other, to build activist networks, and to trust that when the protests were called for, which did in fact happen online, um, to trust that they could go out into the streets and be joined by thousands of people, which they were. So back a couple of years before that, in 2008, I was involved with a global activist network, um, and a lot of the people that I had met around that time were from Egypt, and from lots of other places as well, but the first person that I'm gonna talk to is somebody that I met around that time. This is Wael Abbas. You may have heard of him before, um, and you'll see why. So Abbas is an award-winning journalist. Um, he's won a great number of awards that you can find on his Wikipedia page. Um, I lost my speaker notes, so I can't name them all for you. But one of them was the Knight International Journalism Award. Now, one of the things that he was awarded for was his documentation of police brutality and torture, which probably sounds familiar now in 2018, but back then was something that was like kind of impressive, I think. Um, and so what he did was that he he wasn't the one necessarily documenting the torture, but he had a popular blog that was ad-supported. It got a lot of hits. Um, and his blog ended up kind of becoming the home for that. First his blog and then his YouTube channel. And so YouTube you know, came around 2005, 2006, and by 2007 he had one of the most popular YouTube channels in Egypt. And this is notable because he posted this video 
Now, this is just a still. I'm not gonna play you the video, um, A, because I can't, and B, because um, it's quite graphic, but you can find it online if you're really curious. I, I don't recommend it. Um, but in this video, it showed police beating and raping prisoners in a police station in Cairo, male prisoners. And he received this video and he posted it to YouTube. And it got a lot of attention and in fact, it resulted in the prosecution of those policemen. They were sentenced to three years in prison. So it was a kind of incredible courageous act that had an incredible outcome. Um, but YouTube didn't really agree with that and uh, it's rather interesting what they did. They decided to suspend his account. Um, now, you've probably heard of this happening to other people. In fact, I know that there's at least a couple people in the room that this has happened to themselves, either on YouTube or another social media channel. Um, but YouTube's decision at the time was based on the fact that this contained really graphic violence. They didn't have an exception at the time for violence that was for documentation or um, uh, sort of other kinds of purposes. And we've seen them change over the years since then. That's not what this talks about, but nevertheless, they've kind of changed that. They've gone back and forth. Um, and there's certainly still issues there, but they're much more considerate of sort of documentary purposes of their network. Um, but this brought, his, this brought him great attention from the judiciary, from the government. And in 2009, he was arrested on what turned out to be really bogus charges of damaging an internet cable. Um, oh, sorry, too far ahead. So he was arrested on charges of damaging an internet cable um, and given a pretty large fine for that as well. Eventually that was overturned after a um, pretty extraordinary outcry from groups, uh, human rights groups both in the country and outside of the country. I know the Committee to Protect Journalists was one of the groups that worked on that case. Um, but nevertheless, the government continued to go after him. He wasn't arrested again for quite some time, but in 2016, he was the target of a documented phishing campaign that the Citizen Lab worked on, uh, wor worked to uncover, rather, they did not commit it. Um, and so he's the target of a phishing campaign, and then more recently, last year, he was banned permanently from Twitter. Now, this, I think, was really interesting because he had, he was verified, he had, um, I think 250,000 followers, which is quite a few, and, and definitely quite a few in Egypt where Twitter uptake is not so high. Of course, many of these were international followers as well. Um, and he was suspended from the platform. And I, I don't know how well you can read this, but I'll just give you a couple of highlights. Um, he said that, it, that Twitter deleting his account that documented life and protests and demonstrations in Egypt for 10 years, politics, activism, atrocities, corruption, revolution, um, well, he compared it to Hitler burning books. I think that might be extreme, but nevertheless, um, I see how the comparison to book burning stands. Um, and then he talks about how it's basically an erasure of history. And I think that this is a really salient point. And I'm gonna tell you the story of how his Twitter account actually went down. So the thing about him, he's a wonderful person, but he's also got a bit of a mouth on him. Now, so do I, and I'm sure a lot of people do. Um, but he really likes to go um, kind of clap back or go after the people who harass and attack him. And so he'd been harassed on Twitter for a long time, often by supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood, often by supporters of the government, and he would often make jokes about their mothers. Um, not a very acceptable thing to do, uh, you know, culturally, but not necessarily against Twitter's rules either. And that's what I think is really interesting because what happened was that there was an organized campaign from government supporters to report him for violating Twitter's rules. And as you know, the way that that works is that when someone reports you, a human moderator or perhaps an algorithm sees the report um, and makes a decision either way about the content. Now, these companies say that a number of reports doesn't necessarily result in someone being taken down, but it certainly does result in people being reviewed over and over and over again, especially if those reports are spaced out. And that's what we think happened. Um, he contacted me while this was going on. I raised it to some people, including some Twitter employees and including a couple of um, really high level former Twitter employees, all of whom raised it all the way up to Jack Dorsey as far as we know. That's what I've been told, I can't prove it. Um, but the CEO allegedly heard about this and did nothing, which I think is interesting in the light of the fact that he later would go on to defend Alex Jones, the conspiracy theorist. Nevertheless, um, this mobbing resulted in him being taken down from Twitter. He was also suspended from Facebook. And a few short months later, he was arrested without a warrant in the middle of the night in his pajamas, dragged from his home to the police station. And since then, he's been held in pretrial detention. That was May. Every 15 days, his, his detention is extended. Um, and that's what's still ongoing. And so that's one of the cases that EFF is currently fighting for.
So I'm gonna move on from this one example because I realize I gave you a lot of details there. This is Amal Fati. Um, she's a former actress, she's a mother, she's an activist, um, and she was also recently arrested um, in, in Cairo. She was arrested with her husband, who uh, is the former head of Amnesty there, I believe, and her child. All of them, the whole family, was marched down to the police station, held there for a few hours, until her husband and child were released. But she was detained and has continued to be detained, just like Abbas, every 15 days with a renewal. So what was her great crime? Well, back in May, um, she had had a really rough day. She'd been out and about doing errands in Cairo. She'd gone to the bank, she'd gone to the grocery store, and she'd been sexually harassed all along the way. She went home and she posted a video to Facebook and complaining about harassment, talking about the way that Egyptian men treat women, um, and that video went quickly viral, and she was mobbed online by people yelling at her, telling her, calling her all sorts of names. I'm not going to repeat them, but again, you can find this story. It's been pretty well covered in the media. Um, and as a result of that, two days later, she was arrested. Uh, the charges against her, once again, are completely bogus, um, but it was clearly because of the fact that she drew attention to this phenomenon and criticized the government at the same time. And then this next one is a little hard for me to tell this story because this is a really close friend of mine um, and he's still in prison. Some of you might actually know this person. This is Ala Abdel Fattah um, and he has keynoted some conferences that you may have attended. He keynoted RightsCon in 2011, just after the Egyptian uprising. Um, and he's spoken all over the world at different events about the internet in Egypt and about um, politics there. Now he's someone who spent most of uh, the, the revolution or the uprising in Tahrir Square. Um, his child was born shortly after that. I'll leave that math up to your imagination. Um, his wife is also an incredible person and friend of mine. And he has the distinction of having been detained under every one of the last rulers in Egypt. Mubarak, the Supreme Council of Armed Forces, Morsi, the, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, person who was briefly president, and now Sisi. Um, and in 2013, he was arrested for the most recent time. Um, taken from his home, he missed his father's funeral, um, and he's been detained ever since, basically. Um, in 2014, 2015, I worked with uh, the Media Legal Defense Initiative, so EFF and MLDI worked together to submit a petition to the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, thinking that, okay, well, at least maybe we can get some international attention for this case. And it ping-ponged, it volleyed back and forth, um, Egypt finally commented, we won the petition, I mean, the, the UN Working Group agreed that this was indeed arbitrary detention, that he was being prosecuted and persecuted by the government uh, for his offline activities through online charges, uh, or sorry, his online activities through offline charges, rather. Um, he was, the charges actually included demonstrating and um, vandalism, but clearly had to do with his loud voice and large presence online. Um, and nevertheless, uh, just a few months ago, his appeal was denied, um, and he won't be released until 2020. Um, he's missed his child grow up. His child is six now, um, and yeah, we miss him a lot. And I think one of the things that I want to stress here is just, as I move into the last section of this talk, is who he is as a person, because one of the things that he taught me and one of the things that has guided me through my work over the years is the belief in solidarity across borders. Um, he's, he's someone who, you know, definitely has been very critical of the U.S. government's interfering in the internet freedom community. He's been very critical about a lot of things like that, a lot of the, the sort of corporate funding that happens in this space. Um, but he also feels very strongly that we have to work together in solidarity because our governments are working together. He was one of the first people, you know, to really recognize the way that Western technology companies were exporting their technologies to Egypt and to other countries. Um, and yeah, and I think that that really speaks to how it's important that we all recognize each other and work together across these borders as well. So this project, these, these images that you've seen are all from a project called Offline. It's EFF.org slash offline. It's very easy to find. Um, and those are three of the cases. There are a few more too. I realize we're tight on time, so I'm not going to go through all of them, but I really encourage you to read about them. Um, because right now, 156 journalists are currently imprisoned around the world, and 142 citizen journalists are imprisoned. And in 2017, more than 70% of imprisoned journalists were arrested for activities that were conducted online. 
These are just a handful of the cases that we're covering right now. This is Sayyid Malikpour, who was arrested, returning to Iran and charged on bogus charges of operating a pornography website, even though all he was doing was building a utility to help ease the uploading of photographs. Aman al-Nafshan, whose name you've probably heard, she was one of the Saudi women who um, fought for the right to drive. She was arrested a few months ago um, for videotaping a woman driving, uploading it to the internet, um, and she's been held without trial. Darin Tator, who's from Israel, she's a Palestinian citizen of Israel, um, and she was arrested for her poetry that she uploaded to the internet because the translator, who was from the police department, um, translated some of the words wrong and thought that she was supporting terrorism. And this is Ahmed Mansour, whose name also might be familiar to you. He's from the UAE. Um, he's known sometimes as the million dollar dissident. He actually helped to identify some vulnerabilities in iOS, so you can thank him for that. Um, but it was because his government was going after him through his phone. Um, so those are just a handful of the cases that we're working on. And, you know, I mean, I can't say that we haven't had successes too. There have been a couple of recent ones. Um, again, I encourage you to look at the site because I'm very conscious of the time. But I just want to end by saying that to remind you that often it is the use of Western technologies that help to aid in the censorship and surveillance of individuals all over the world. And it's not just in the Middle East, although that happens to be where the cases that I talked about today are focused. It's in Vietnam, Ethiopia, a number of countries all over the world, and I would say increasingly happening in parts of Europe as well. Um, so I encourage you to learn more about this project and to learn more about some of these cases, and thank you. <laughs>